I have moved about this world of ours, and ever in search of the finest of its kind, we bring you the tops in Spine Chillers. The Creaking Door. Manufacturers of State Express 3-5 Filter King cigarettes take pleasure in presenting The Creaking Door. Don't understand. Hey. I tried to save his life, and now it's too late. Hey, don't you give me that. This fellow was given a decent Christian burial. You desecrated. Desecrated, you say? Isn't it desecration to bury a man while he's still alive? Hey, hey, what you talking about? You don't think people go around being buried alive these days, do you? I don't know what to make of you. Hey. I watched you this afternoon. I, I thought you looked a bit uh, peculiar. I don't know what you was doing at a pauper's burial. He shouldn't have had a pauper's burial. He shouldn't have been buried at all. I could have saved him. Hey, you better think up a good story. Something told me that you was up to no good. No, no, no. Don't you try to rush stuff. I've already warned you. I watched you. The police are on their way. Breaking open a coffin like that. Eh? And you was up to something, but I never thought... It's because... Hey. Because I let him get buried alive and I was ashamed. Let him get buried alive for a measly 50 pounds. Now he's dead. Hey, you come out of a loony bin or something. Now that I've had a bit of look at you, you, you don't look like no grave robber. I'm not. Listen. What's he to you, this fellow we buried today, eh? Nothing. Except I'm responsible for his death. I touched him. He, he's cold. Cold as dead. He, he's only been in the ground a few hours. They don't stay cold like that. Sometimes we get an exhumation order. We have to dig him up, see? Hey, you'd be surprised how warm they get. He is dead, isn't he? I mean, I brought this piece of mirror with me. There's no breath. Look. <laughs> I don't have to look. He's been in the municipal wall for two days. He's given a pauper's burial. Now then, what's it all about, young man? I want to go home. 
He was dead all right when they buried him. But not when the ambulance took him to the morgue. You see, I know. You know? Oh, is he a relative of yours? I never knew he existed until two days ago. I've been tramping the streets looking for work. I didn't want to go home. If you could call that one-room bedsitter, let her now occupy a home. It was still ringing in my ears, the things she shouted at me as I left them. I've come to the end of my tether. I've pawned everything. Look, look, even the wedding ring you slipped on my finger in the church. What did he say? And all thy worldly goods. <laughs> That's a laugh. You were going to share all your worldly goods, were you? Well, if you don't get some money or a job, I'm walking out on you, do you hear? I'm walking out on you and I'll go and live with my sister. At least I'll get some warmth and three square meals a day. Oh, don't say that, Lil. Was it my fault that I fell sick? That I'm not allowed to work in the factory anymore? I've tried, Lil. I really have. Everywhere I go, they look at me and say, no vacancies. Not my fault either. I warn you, Joe Harris. I can't take much more of this. I know, honey, I know. I'll, I'll get something today. Really, I will. I promise. <laughs> It was a promise I couldn't keep. Turning the pavement. Watching the dislike and fear in the eyes of the well-fed as they said, no oh, thank you. Fear that one day they might become like me. And then I saw him. I was cutting through Duke's lane. Nothing on either side except a huge big wall. He was a short, fat little man. Our steps were loud in the quiet part of there. Something in his pocket. Holy, Blimey. Lost all his money, but must be fifty quid here at least. Poor swine. What good is his money now? I, I better call a cop. If you don't get some money or a job, I'm walking out on you. Do you hear? I'm walking out. There's nothing anybody can do for this poor swine. I'll find him soon enough. Up. What does the guard do in a case like this? Beat it, you fool. Beat it with the first decent money you've had in months. Somebody will find him. Run. Leo. Joe. Joe, you've got some money. That's right, Leo. Two five-pound notes, 31 pound notes, and the rest in ten bum notes. Oh. It all adds up. Adds up very nicely. Fifty quid in all. Oh, Joe, honey... Hi. How did you get this money? You didn't go and do anything silly, did you? Such as what? Rob a bank? I wouldn't know how to start. But how did you get it? You'll never believe it. Remember I told you that when I was in the sanatorium, there was a fellow there with the same lung trouble named Ted Brown? Yes. Well, uh, I lent him a quid. You lent him a quid? Well, I was... Well, I was still drawing my wages, wasn't I? We didn't know that the doctor wouldn't let me go back to the factory. It wasn't so bad then. Oh, that's all right, ma'am. What about this Ted Brown? Well, I'll meet him in the street, see? Says he'd been looking for me everywhere. Wanted to repay me the quid. Go on. Well, we goes into a pub to have a drink. Uh, there was a bookie there, and Ted said he'd had a hot tip for the double. It won, Lil. Fifty smackers. Oh, Joe. Fifty smackers. Oh, I love you. Lil went to get some groceries and a couple of bottles of beer. I sat on the bed and had a further look at the wallet. Having taken the money out, I thought it would be empty. There were two pockets, both with plastic windows. The first held a card which said, Harold Maxted, 26 Fairley Street, Ormsey. And then I looked at the second plastic window. There were strange words printed on a white card. It said, I am not dead. I'm subject to a form of cataleptic illness which may appear to cause death. If I'm found, notify Dr. Alfred Miller, Hornsey, 6641. No. No, it can't be. Not dead. Cataleptic. What have I done? What have I done? They'll think he's... Oh, no. Telephone. I must telephone. 
That Leo's the one where I've gone. I've, I've given all my money. Yeah, Wally. Oh, thank you for that. Here, chuck these bottles from me, will you? Joe? What is it? What time is it, darling? I don't know. The pub was just opening just after six, I should say. Why? Well, Give me ten bob to get me change. I need some silver. I have to telephone. I, I won't be long, mate. What is it? Well, I'm, I've just got to telephone someone. You're not going gambling, are you? You haven't got the buck. You're not betting on tomorrow's races or anything like that, are you, Joe? There are all those bills to be paid. I know, love, I know. No, I'm not gambling, but I need it, please. I'll be back in a little while. It, it's just that... Please, Leo. All right. Here you are. Joe? It's all right, love. Would I be too late with the phone call? Would they bury this poor guy Max said, not knowing he was a cataleptic, thinking he was dead? <laughs> this is the mother of the doctor and something in my spot. Dr. Miller, please. Uh, Dr. Miller's gone abroad. Well, he's been away for the last six weeks. Abroad? Oh, no. Have you taken over his practice, sir? No, I'm not a medical man. But if you're in need of a doctor, there must be plenty. Oh, no, no, isn't that... You don't know which hospital Dr. Miller was at? I'm afraid I can't help you. I must go. My wife's shouting. The dinner's on the table. I'm sorry. Thank you. And then another thought seared my brain. A hole in the ground. A long wooden box and the man being buried. Being buried alive. And a shovel. Heaping earth on the wooden boards. Max, Max said that there must be a Max to in the telephone directory. There was. Fourteen Max Teds. Everyone alive and bad-tempered. No, I have little relatives who suffer from a cataleptic illness. But a plenty of other Maxes of the book, try right them. I have. You're Mr. Zachariah Maxted. You're the last on the list. Well, I can't help you. <laughs> what now? Do I go along to the police and say, Look, I stole a man's wallet. Somebody might be shoving him in six foot of earth. What do I do? I decided to sleep on it. Sleep. <laughs> That's a laugh. Oh, this... Very the line. Love you, Lou. Love you. Please. Pinching one. <laughs> They're putting me in a wooden box. And it's your fault, Joe Addis. I'm struggling for breath. They're going to bury me. Bury me deep. But not deep enough, Joe. Get me out of this or I'll make you suffer here on earth and in the beyond. Get three fives. Get the taste. By State Express. Get the taste of international success. The taste that's uniquely three fives. Only when no expense is spared in its making can a cigarette taste so right, so smooth, so satisfying. Three fives. Get the taste. The taste that State Express created for you. The taste that has made three fives. The king-size cigarette of international success. Get three fives. Get the taste. Better do something about it pretty soon. 
Otherwise, the poor, unfortunate, cataleptic gentleman will be stiff with the cold. But let us see what he does do. Do? I didn't know what to do. It was less than six hours since I saw that chap fall. Maybe he's still there. Maybe if I go back to Duke's Lane, he'll still be lying there. Sorry, Amy, I didn't want to wake you up. It's the middle of the night. Where are you going? I won't be long. No, Joe, you're not going anywhere. I thought you'd been acting strange. Oh, Joe, I know I've nagged you and threatened you, but it was only because you were getting so down, so beaten. I love you, Joe. I don't want you to be doing anything that will put you in prison. Uh, it isn't that at all. Well, what is it? All right, Lou, I'll, I'll tell you. And then you'll see why I have to go. I told her. I told her the whole story of how I robbed a man I thought was dead. A corpse that had no use for the 50 quid in his wallet. So you see, I've got to find him. Or find out where they've taken him. They don't think he's dead, oh, Liz. Joe. Joe. Somebody will have found him by now. He's probably lying in bed fast asleep. People who have these sort of fits do recover. No, they don't. After I'd found all the maxes I could, I went into the Warnsby Library and I looked it up. Unless they get assistance, they can stay that way for days. By then, they They'll bury him. And you know what that makes me? A murderer. I'm letting a man die for 50 quid. Oh, no, Joe. Why don't you phone the police station? Why don't you phone the Hornsby police station? Tell them the... Oh, no, Joe. You... No, you can't do that. They'll call you a thief and put you away. Look, I'm getting dressed. I'm coming with you. Where did you say it was? You explain. Joe, let's pray he's still there. Well, that might be worse. He might have died for lack of attention. Let's pray someone saw him and took him to hospital and they realised he wasn't... wasn't dead. It's a copper. Uh, it's a bit nippy this time of the morning, isn't it? You're off night work, are you? What? Yeah, yeah that's right. Oh, there was a little commotion in, in Duke's Lane a few hours ago, so, so my friend Phyllis told me. And uh, something happened in Duke's Lane. Oh, yes, yes. Just before I came on duty. The postman saw a bloke lying in the lane here. Dropped dead. Dead? They sure he's dead? So the police surgeon said. Why? Know anything about it? No. No, we don't know anything about it. It was just that... Well, we wondered if it was anybody we knew, that's all. Oh. Well, I believe they've identified him, all right. If you nip round to the station, they may be able to tell you. Oh, I don't think it's anybody we know. Oh, come on, lad. Too cold to stand here chatting. Let's go off to bed. You too, Mary. Yes. <laughs> you should have been in bed ages ago. <coughs> or rather, good morning. Let's go to the police station. Now. No, Joe, no. You'll have to explain about the wallet. Besides, this policeman doesn't really know. Please come home. But, Lil... It's no good, Joe. We're going home. Come on. Some more coffee, Joe. No, thanks. Lil, it's no good. We've got to go to the police. We're committing murder. It's two days now. I didn't sleep a wink all night last night. Kept having nightmares. Hearing Maxted's voice pounding in my brain. Pounding my brain. Telling me to save him before it's too late. You're the only one that can save me, Ash. They're burying me this afternoon. They're putting me in a coffin and they're going to cover me with earth. If you allow this to happen to me, you're a murderer, Joe Alice. A murderer, do you hear? You'll be punished. 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 He kept saying I'd be punished. But you said yourself it's only a nightmare. All right, don't you go. I will. I'll say that I know... What was his name? Maxted. Harold Maxted. I'll say I know him and he's a cataleptic. That's it. I'll go there right away. Excuse me. Oh, no. Aren't you the young lady I saw down Duke's Lane the other night? Yes, that's right. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. You know we were talking about someone who dropped dead that afternoon. Well, were you able to identify him? Yes, we were able to identify him, all right. Why? He's a cataleptic. He's not really dead, you know. Oh, don't be funny. I've got the cart here. They're burying him this afternoon. He's in the Ornstein mortuary. Cardiac failure. This is the release for the body for him to be buried. Signed by the police surgeon, Dr. Herbert Spencer. 
He may have been a cataleptic, I don't know about that, but he died of heart failure. Being buried in a pauper's grave at Hornsey Cemetery three o'clock this afternoon. Did die of heart failure, indeed. <laughs> Not dead. Oh, well, maybe I'm being a bit silly. Thank you, Constable. Good night. The death certificate was signed by the police surgeon. Oh, what did that copper know about cataleptics? Had the doctor known he was a cataleptic? I'm going to stop the burial. You can't, Joe, you can't. Why don't you tell the police about that wallet? Where are you going, Joe? I don't know. Get drunk. I don't know anything anymore. Even my glass of beer went so in my mouth. I bought it with blood money. The blood that Harold mixed it. I left the pub and walked. So they were burying him in a pauper's grave, were they? I didn't ask my feet to move towards the cemetery. It seemed as though they didn't belong to me. They were burying him as I got there. The minister, the grave digger, and an old man. Obviously the caretaker, plus a police sergeant. I wanted to shout, don't. Don't put him in that grave. He's not a corpse, he's alive. Couldn't. Those three stripes on a copper sleeve seem to represent a number of years I might get for stealing and for withholding information. I ran from the cemetery as though I were running from the vengeance of Maxted himself. All right, Jack. They buried him, Miller. I saw them do it. A cheap wooden coffin. <laughs> or maybe it's a good thing the coffin was a cheap one. Maybe the death watch beetle got it in. Maybe there are holes in it. Maybe the poor swine will be able to breathe. <laughs> Fifty measly nicker. Fifty rotten pounds. And I, I've turned myself into a murderer. But you look like they'll nab you too. They'll say you were part of the conspiracy. What have I done to you? What have I done to us? Nothing, Joe. All right, so you pinched his wallet when we were both starving. No one can have you up for, for murder. But it's beside the point now, isn't it, Lil? He's down there struggling for breath, isn't he? He won't be struggling for long. I don't know anything about cataleptics, but you can't be nailed inside a coffin underneath six foot of earth for long. Look out the window, Lily. It's got dark already. It's winter, Joe. I know the grave, Bill. I'm going back. Joe. You're not going to stop me, Bill. I'm going back and I'm going to get him out of that grave. Please, Lil, I've got to. I'll come with you. Oh, no, no. I couldn't bear that. I've got to do this on my own. The post, the post needs too heavy for you. You're not strong, Joe. It's a pulper's grave, Leo. They didn't take much trouble with him. But the, why a pulper? With all that money in his wallet. That makes it worse, doesn't he? Maybe they couldn't raise his relatives. What with his doctor gone away and everything. Here, Leo, get me that hammer out of the drawer. It's got that thing at the end for taking nails out. And, and that piece of mirror. All right. Here. I hope you're right. But you know what you're doing. It's the only way, Lil. The only way. So here I am, isn't it? It's too late. He's dead, all right. Blow me, young man. I wouldn't be in your shoes, not for nothing. Hey, just a minute. Uh, what did you say this bloke's name is? Maxted. Harold Maxted. Oh, no, it's not. What? Uh, this bloke's name is Sidney Fraser. Are you sure it's the same bloke? Positive. No, it's the same bloke. His accusing face follows me around, sleeping and waking. Oh, you young man, you come and have a look at me. We don't give them much of a tombstone, these paupers. There you are. Sidney Fraser. Born February 6, 1920. Died December 4th, 1967. Well, I've told you everything. They've given him the wrong name. If, uh, you better tell that to the police constable. Oh, I'm sorry about this, young man. I warned you. Uh, I thought I was too old to tackle you on my own. When you started opening that grave, I ran to the cemetery office and phoned the police. Oh, well, it's almost a relief in a way. Well, hello. What's going on here? Oh, it's you again. Your missus was in the police station this morning with some nonsense about... Huh? Digging up a grave, are you? Oh, there's something fishy going on. When I told my sergeant that your wife came in and said we were burying someone who was a cataleptic and not dead, he nearly strangled me. So I should have taken full particulars. So I ought to charge you both with causing a public nuisance. This fellow, Sidney Fraser, has had our trouble for years. Huh? 
Sometimes an ordinary hospital had the pleasure of his company. More often than not, it was a prison hospital. Our police sergeant warned him that he hadn't got long to live. And your wife comes in with a cock and bull story about being him alive. As if we didn't know him. <laughs> Sidney Fraser. In his day, he was the finest pickpocket in Hornsey. Pickpocket? Uh, why, only the other day we had a complaint from Mr. Maxted that someone had stolen his wallet. Huh. Bloke jostled him at a bus stop and then started running. <laughs> from his description, we knew it was Sid. <laughs> <laughs> he pickmacked his pocket. He wasn't a cataleptic. He was a pickpocket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You'd better pull yourself together. Uh, what are you doing here, and why is this grave open? Oh, uh, Constable, our young friend here got a bit mixed up. I opened the grave to show him he was mistaken. Then why did you ring the police saying there was a suspicious character lurking in the cemetery? Well, seems I was mistaken, that's all, Constable. In fact, we were both mistaken. Weren't we, young man? Hey. <laughs> Big pocket. <laughs> Cattle and chicken. <laughs> <laughs> should have told Joe Harris that lifting wallets from cataleptic gentlemen is a most grave offense. In fact, it is likely to incur a most stiff penalty. <laughs> international success. The taste that's uniquely three fives. Only when no expense is spared in its making can a cigarette taste so right, so smooth, so satisfying. Three fives. Get the taste. The taste that State Express created for you. The taste that has made three fives the king-size cigarette of international success. Get three fives. Get the taste. This is your host back again. Just a reminder of our rendezvous next week. Where are we going? Through the creaking door. Of course. <laughs> the manufacturers of State Express 3-5 Filter King cigarettes invite you to listen next Saturday at 9 o'clock when they will again present The Creaking 